Welcome back to Diary of an Empath. Once again, I just want to thank all of my listeners for all the reviews. I read all of them, and I'm just so happy to hear that it's resonating. I know it's a fairly new podcast, but it's been growing, and I'm just so thankful for all of you who have been a part of this journey. So today, I want to talk about a subject that's kind of near and dear to me because it's something that I recently went through. And um, I want to talk about ghosting. And today's guest, she's a three-time published author, holistic life coach, a Reiki master, and a certified trauma support specialist, and she runs her own podcast. So without further ado, please welcome my next guest, Amy Fiedler. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I've watched some of your videos and I follow you on Instagram and I, I knew I had to have you on this show, especially with the fact that I recently was ghosted. And it's something that, you know, until it happens to you, it's very traumatizing. And, you know, trauma is very individualized, but it's, it can leave someone feeling very, very confused. So I, I want to kind of give a definition of what ghosting is because for some of the listeners, they may not know. So what is ghosting? Sure, of course. So ghosting is super traumatic. It's also a covert form of abuse. And the way I would define ghosting is somebody disappearing out of your life who you've actively been communicating with. They didn't set a boundary. They didn't ask for space. They didn't say they don't want to see you anymore. You reach out to them. They're not answering. And you continue to reach out to them. And they continue to just leave you on red give you the silent treatment and not respond or answer your questions. And that's a great definition because that's exactly what happened to me. And it left me feeling extremely confused, had no idea what was going on. And to me, because I am just a communicative person, I, I, I don't understand why you can't just communicate that. So for me, it left me feeling very, very confused. And one thing I posted about ghosting not too long ago, and I got an influx of people who kind of attacked me a little bit. So I want to ask, what's the difference between ghosting someone out of respect for yourself or just avoiding someone because you don't want to deal with the issue? You know, that's a great question because everybody really gets this confused. There's a clear distinction between you respecting yourself and you ghosting someone. You respecting yourself is you upholding a boundary that you've communicated to another person. So if you've said to somebody, listen, I'm really stressed out. I don't have time in my schedule right now. Can I get back to you in a few weeks? Or can we like pick up where we left off in a few months? That's a boundary. So if they reach out again, you're upholding your boundary by not communicating with them because you've already let them know where you stand. But then when there's no communication, and that's the distinction here, when there's no communication of a boundary, that's when it's ghosting. Exactly. I think that's such a great point because if you are communicating to say, I don't like it when you do X, Y, and Z, or this is what I need from you. And that person is not respecting your boundaries or is not doing what you need to do in order to protect your energy. I think that is an acceptable time for you to say, you know what, I'm not going to deal with this person because they're toxic or they're not good for my energy. And I think that's the key difference between just randomly ghosting someone because in my situation, I was dating a guy, talking to a guy, things were going great, thought the guy was super interested, really interested. And it's like, poof, just disappears. Reached out once. Okay. I'll give it a, give it a day or two. Give it a week. Reached out twice. Not a fucking word. Reached out a third time. And I'm like, I think I'm being ghosted. And it's very, very confusing and traumatized. So it led me to remember and think about attachment styles and, um, I remember doing research on avoidant attachment. And I wanted to ask you, do you think that there's a correlation between having an avoidant attachment style and someone who ghosts? There's definitely a correlation because somebody who's ghosting you has a problem speaking up for themselves. And usually that's coming from a fear, probably back in childhood, of a fear of backlash or a fear of punishment or a fear of abandonment because they're asking for something and they're trying to claim their needs and wants and they fear that you're not going to be able to respect it or give it to them. So truly, the person ghosting people is the one with the insecurity. They are fearing abandonment 
And in them ghosting you, you end up feeling abandoned. So that's kind of the fuckery of it all because they leave you feeling the exact way they're avoiding trying to feel. Yes, that's exactly, exactly how I felt. I feel so validated right now because in it's like in the same aspect that you're avoiding the person because you don't want to be the asshole or you don't want to feel the asshole. It's really about them, right? Because they're not really caring about how you feel. It's more about how they feel because they don't want to feel that abandonment that they don't want to feel like the asshole. But then in turn, you are felt confused. You're feeling abandoned. So it's like a double-edged sword and it's a complete circle. So that's an amazing point. And so I guess that, that leads to my question too is, and it, and it kind of correlates with what you were just saying, but why do you think they have such a hard time communicating? Do you think it's from childhood? Do you think that they don't know how to communicate or they just simply don't want to? I mean, I think it's all of the above, quite frankly. I think they, that a lot of them, I, I don't think we can blanket one reason across every person who goes because there's definitely people who struggle with maybe bipolar disorder or things like that, that have a hard time speaking up or ADHD. And so they avoid, they don't know how to communicate effectively in that moment, or maybe they don't know how to regulate themselves enough to communicate in that moment. But a lot of them, definitely it's stemming from childhood. It's stemming from experiences where a trusted adult in their life, a parent or guardian perhaps gave them the silent treatment or when they did speak up for themselves, they got love withheld or they got punished for it. And so when that's recycling inside of our minds or like with trauma, it's your body remembering that incident. And so you try to avoid having to experience that all over again. And it, it's sad because everybody, and, and I've been ghosted before too, and I, I've done lots of interviews on this topic. A lot of people who have been ghosted are wondering, what did I do wrong? I'm not sure what did I say or what did I do? Or why couldn't you just let me know? Like, did I give off some sort of sign in your direction that I wouldn't be able to cope or accept that you needed time or space or you weren't interested? And the reality is, is that that person ghosting is really traumatized or fearing something. And they're just really rippling out their pain into the world. And, and that's where I can have compassion, but also be like, that's fucked up. You should try to work through that, right? Because you can't go around just leaving people on red and not letting them know, hey, I'm not interested or, you know, I don't have time for you anymore, or whatever the case may be. Right. And I think for a lot of empaths too, it's hard for us because we have so much compassion for other people. That's kind of like our superpower. And at the same time, one of our weaknesses, because we are able to really understand people at their core. So it's not that I don't recognize red flags. I've gotten better as I've gotten older, but it's like I'm able to see the, um, the weaknesses or feel compassion. Okay. Well, this person probably went through this. So this is why they're acting like that. But I've noticed too. That there's a lot of successful women and beautiful women who are ghosted, and it's extremely debilitating for. Because I know for me, like I'm like I'm successful. I know what I bring to the table. I didn't change, and it. I had to really take a step back and understand. You know, it, this is not me. This is all about him because I couldn't understand. It was so confusing. So you bring up so many good points that it's it's all about what they're going through and the avoidance and not wanting to deal with things that maybe is being triggered from their childhood. So thank you, because that's extremely validating for those of us that have been ghosted. Yeah, but uh, but to that point, I'd love to comment on that because it is a lot of beautiful, successful men or women, right? But I, I talk to mostly women a lot of the time who have been on the receiving end of this. And it's easy to go to that place of insecurity and trying to like internalize what has just happened. But the reality is, is that sometimes these men, we we put on pedestals perhaps, and they're easily intimidated. Maybe they don't feel good enough. So they feel like they might be letting you down by saying, I can't come through on this or no, I'm not available at this day or time. And it, it's, it's, it's easy for somebody who's empathetic to drop into that place of compassion and, and not have your own boundaries and make excuses and easily just feel for them. But you know, it, it's, 
it's detrimental to us when we don't go quickly to a place of confidence and recognize this isn't us. Like if you didn't say it or do it, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to them. You were the one trying to communicate. They were not. And so how does somebody cope? Is it, is it more beneficial to try to get closure? Because I, I, I'm conflicted with this myself. I had a good friend always tell me, you don't always need someone to provide you closure to give yourself closure. But then there's that other part of me that is like, fuck that. I didn't deserve that. I want closure. I want to know the how, the when, the why. So what does somebody do in that situation to get closure? Should they get closure? Well, so what I always tell people to do is like, if you have something unspoken inside of you, when you're in that moment of feeling ghosted, there's no harm in you sending a very thorough, clear message just to get that out of you. Because the goal with emotions is you want them out of your body. You don't want them recycling that narrative that might be painful. So even if you're blocked, send the message that says, hey, you could have just communicated to me that you were no longer interested. And, you know, and and say everything you need to say so you leave no words unspoken and then let it rest. It's not about their response so much as it is getting it out of your body. Another alternative, if people don't feel comfortable doing that, is to maybe just write on paper or text it to yourself what you would have liked to say to them. Because I think that's where we have a hard time coping is we have unspoken words and they're just recycling inside of us. And we don't feel that's the part of ghosting that really sucks is we don't feel like we were given a space to feel heard. Nobody gave us a chance to communicate. We were dismissed. We were, you know, neglected. We were abandoned and you're left with all of these questions. So why not throw it out there? I tell clients sometimes like, what? Just call them out on it. Hey, is this you ghosting me? You know, I'm not down for that type of treatment or that behavior. You could have just let me know you weren't interested, but good luck to you. I'm shaking my head because I'm like, this is speaking to me. I always write stuff out and my friends make fun of me because I will literally go in my notes section and I'll have three different options to send to the person, at least in this situation. I'm like, okay, so I send option one, option two. And yes, sometimes women, we do this, we talk to each other and, you know, because I don't want to be that girl sending paragraphs. I've been there, done that. I'm 35. I'm like, I don't have time for that. I ended up not doing that in this situation. And a part of me regrets it. If somebody is wanting to respond to a poster, I know for me, I was really debating on sending this long paragraph and saying exactly how I felt. But I stopped myself because I didn't want to be that girl to send a paragraph. Do you suggest that somebody just lets it all out because you have nothing to lose? Or should we keep it short and sweet and to the point? I really am a strong proponent of regulating your emotions before saying anything to anyone. So definitely don't like unleash your fury in their, (laughs) (laughs) in their inbox or anything like that. You don't want to sound like five paragraphs and then walk away feeling embarrassed or or something because now there's no response. I would sit down with yourself, get clear about how you're actually feeling. And then if at that point, once you're regulated, you want to send something that says very directly and transparently what you were wanting or needing or how you were feeling, then I would say, keep it a little contained, keep it short and sweet, get to the point, but get it out of you for sure. I love that. Don't unleash your fury because I think in the moment, <laughs> I know I've been in that moment, like what a fucking asshole that you're going to go to be. Like you can't just speak how you feel and just as a older man, you can't just say how you feel. But a lot of people don't, don't have the emotional maturity to respond like an adult. And so I, I love that. Please, you know, men, ladies, don't unleash your fury. Give it some time. Write it out. <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> Now, what if they come back? Because, you know, sometimes people tend to circle around. And I've thought about this too. Should, if the ghoster comes back, should we still try to get closure? Or should we just say, you know what? It's not worth my energy. Let me just ignore a block. Well, so to, to that question, I, back when I was dating, I had two people who had ghosted me return. And they returned with an apology and then a, could I get a second chance and all of this stuff. But 
the in-between, between them ghosting me and them returning, I had really processed that experience and gotten clear with myself about what my boundaries are and what I'm looking for in a relationship. And I think that's really where the work is for the person that's on the receiving end of being ghosted is this is your opportunity to get really clear with yourself about what boundaries you need when you're entering into a friendship, relationship, family relationship, whatever the case is, right? What type of communication do you want? Respect and value. So when and if they return, you're very clear on what you're willing to tolerate or not. You're very clear on where the parameters are in terms of what's going to maybe welcome them back in. Because I wouldn't say, you know, never, right? There are people that learn from their mistakes. I think, you know, you've gone through growth in your life. I've gone through growth in my life. I would want people to give me a second chance if I screw up. But you on the other end have to be super clear on what your expectations are and what that looks like. And then let that person show you through their actions and their words that they can come through on that, right? So if you know they're incapable of speaking up and they're capable of ghosting you and they pop back up, having the expectation they might not ghost again is ridiculous because that's in them. They've shown you what they're capable of. So you have to know, okay, I expect them to show me something different. And I'm going to now do something different. I'm going to hold my standards. And if they can't come through, lesson learned. They didn't learn from that mistake. And they're still stuck in this place where they can't speak up for themselves. I think those are great points. Because if you keep your boundaries, you know, to a certain standard, and you say, this this is my expectation. So I might agree to meet with them. I might agree to have a conversation with them. But my boundaries and my standards are solid. I think you're setting yourself up for success because if they don't meet those standards and those boundaries, well, they're showing you who they are. They are telling you who they are. And you can set your boundaries to say, this is what I expect. This is what I want. And if you can't come through to meet those, then I'm going to walk away. But I think when you don't have those boundaries set from the beginning, especially if they're coming back into your life, that is where you're setting yourself up for possible heartbreak and, and disappointment because then you have those expectations that, oh no, they're changed. But really, you can't have those expectations of someone because they've already shown you once. And it's not to say people can't change, right? But you have to protect your heart. You have to protect your energy. So I think that's a good point. You know, you you, you have to make a judgment on yourself to keep those boundaries. Now, what about the ghoster, though? What if you are the person listening right now and you're the one who's doing the ghosting? How can they better have... How can they have better communication styles, better communicate their feelings? Are there there any mechanisms that you would recommend for a ghoster? Well, they've got to work through their abandonment issues, right? They've got to start to work through what's holding them back from really claiming their needs and wants in a friendship or relationship. What's stopping them from setting the boundaries they need to set? Because that's really what it is. They go silent because... They don't know how to communicate a boundary to you. They don't know how to say, I'm busy. I need space. I'm not interested. And so that's an insecurity on their end, probably rooted in fear or trauma or possible abuse from childhood, whatever it might be. They have to actually look at that. What is stopping them from speaking up for themselves? And once they reconcile that in their own mind, then it's really just baby steps, working that muscle of slowly speaking up and starting to claim their needs little by little so they get comfortable and trusting that they're capable of doing it with other people in their life. And you mentioned earlier about ghosting as a covert form of abuse. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Because I think that's a really interesting point because when we think of abuse, we think physical or verbal abuse, but we don't always think about the emotional impact that abuse can have on a person. So I really want to go into a little bit more detail on on COVID forms of abuse because I agree with you. And I think that's a really interesting point. I love that you asked that because I get a lot of backlash. (laughs) I get a lot of people saying, you know, that as, as you just said, that the only forms of abuse are the obvious ones. But emotional abuse is just as painful as getting punched in the face. Mm-hmm. No, neglect. 
the silent treatment, somebody invalidating your feelings are all forms of covert abuse. Now, does that mean that the person is always doing it from a malicious place? No, it just means they lack their own healthy coping mechanisms. They lack their um, healthy communication styles. And so maybe they don't know how to support you. So they say, you shouldn't feel that way. And they think they're being helpful instead of saying, I understand why you're feeling that way. So, you know, the covert forms of abuse might not be so obvious to the eye because they're not always like tangible and right in front of us, but they cause a lot of internal pain and they really are the driving force behind a lot of our behavior patterns that fall into the unhealthy category. Yes, I agree. I, I I can see, you know, why some people wouldn't necessarily understand that because when we think of abuse, we think of black eyes, we think about what the media portrays. But you know, when we're talking about covert forms of abuse, even even when when going back to my, my episode on the narcissist, it's really ways that are not as obvious, but they can be extremely traumatizing to the person, especially if not even talking about the ghoster, but the ghost he has their own childhood trauma or their own forms of abandonment. Maybe they just explore or explore it differently as they got older and it comes out differently in their relationship. Maybe they're more anxious attachment as opposed to um, avoidant. And we'll talk about that later in another episode. So you, you mentioned boundary setting. Um, is boundary setting, is it, is, is it emotional immaturity? Or do you think that that's something that is more mature? Well, I think people who struggle setting boundaries didn't have an example of boundaries growing up. So could we call them emotionally immature? Sure, we could, because they probably deal with things when in, in rather unhealthy ways, right? They don't know how to set a boundary, so they get passive aggressive, or they go silent on you, and you know, they, or they manipulate you. People who have boundaries are mature because they can claim their needs and their wants. They're confident in speaking up for themselves and saying, this is how I feel, or this is what I need, or this is what I value, and this is what I'm needing from you in order to feel safe and supported in our interaction or conversation or relationship. Boundaries are really essential for any healthy relationship to sustain itself, because without them then you know you're constantly overstepping people are constantly assuming things there's a lot of unspoken communication and that leads to resentment and that leads to problems and then you know the relationship just kind of self destructs do you feel like in the beginning of a relationship or when you're dating somebody I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but for me, I think for me moving forward, I almost want to have that conversation from the very beginning to say, listen, I'm really big on communication. So if there is something that is bothering you or if there's something that you just need some space with, just let me know. Do you think it's good to have that conversation early on? Or do you think that if somebody's dealing with those childhood traumas, that it's not going to matter anyway? Well, I mean... If they're dealing with their traumas, it might not matter anyway, but your behavior is a reflection of you. I see no harm. I actually only see good in speaking up and being really real, raw, and transparent with people. Saying from the get-go, I'm, I'm an honest and direct communicator. It might not click for them immediately, but at least you said it right? So at least you're not going into that assuming they just know to communicate a certain way with you. You've let them know, this is how I receive information well. This is what I'm expecting. Nobody can meet your expectations. Nobody can respect your boundaries if it's not communicated. My biggest thing is if you're entering into a date, a, a new relationship of any kind, or you're just starting the date, be really clear about what you need up front because it's going to cut through the bullshit rather quick. So I think that's a great point about setting your boundaries from the very beginning, because I know for me, I feel like I didn't set those boundaries with the situation that I was in from day one. And I usually am very good about that. But because of the situation I was in, he's in the entertainment industry. I didn't want to be that girl to come up too clingy. And, you know, I regret doing that because I feel like had I have done that, I would have saved myself some time. And I feel like if you set your boundaries from the beginning, at least you know you were your true self. You did everything you were supposed to do on your end. And if they end up ghosting you or they're not their pers you know, the person that you wanted them to be, then they're just not your person. Perfect. I, I wanted to ask about 
family. What happens when it's a family member or it's a friend? You know, we're talking a lot about romantic relationships. But what about friendships? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, honestly, it's the same guidance all around, whether it's a friend or a family member or, you know, a random stranger that you're starting to get to know. The ghoster still falls into that same category. They're struggling to speak up for themselves. When it's family, there's a different expectation we carry, kind of like what you just shared about that dating experience, right? Because of what the person did for a living, you kind of factor that into an adjustment in your behavior which is what we can't do, but we tend to do with family or when we label someone our best friend, we start to make exceptions. We start to change who we are because of the category we've placed them in. You have to be able to look at everybody on an even playing field and not elevate them above you or below you or anything like that so that you're a constant in all your relationships, right? Because you're that common denominator. So the goal at the end of the day is not to worry about whether it's your mother, your sister, or your cousin, or the guy you just met on a dating app. It's, am I staying true to myself in this interaction, this interaction, and this interaction? That is so powerful and speaks to my heart because that makes such a good point. And you have to put yourself on an even playing field. And I know that I found myself doing that putting somebody a little bit more on a different pedestal and it wasn't correlating with who I was as a person because I had to take a step back and ask myself, if this was a regular schmegular person that I met, would I be doing this? Would I be second guessing myself? And the answer is no, because I'm so good with putting the fucking boundaries down and saying, if you're not meeting this, then I'm out. And that's why, you know, I always tell people if, if you're dating someone and four weeks, it doesn't work out. That's okay. You're dating correctly. You're not putting up with the bullshit. And that's usually how I am. But I found myself making exceptions. So that's an incredible point that you have to put yourself on everyone on an even playing field and not make exceptions just because they are the person that they are. So how can we manage our feelings, the lingering feelings after being ghosted? What can we do? Because, you know, as we talked about, it can be traumatizing, confusing, and hurtful. So what can we do to kind of get ourselves back in a place of stability and regulate our emotions? We have to remember that the person that ghosted us is struggling with their own stuff. And so I think that's really the first step is having that awareness, that emotional intelligence in that moment that we maintain to realize this person struggles to communicate. Is that what I really want in my life? And if the answer is no to that, then the next step is really just to feel how you're feeling. I'm a, I'm a strong proponent of really just, it's not negative or positive, feel it. Because emotions will pass just like clouds. And then you will make space to be able to move forward with clarity from that fucked up experience. Because all, all these bad experiences we have, have bring us clarity to move forward with. Like in your case, it's now like this imprint in your body of, okay, you know what? The next person I meet, regardless of what industry they're in or who they are, right? I'm going to act the same way I do with my friends or my family or whomever in my life. I'm going to maintain my authenticity. I'm going to stay in my confidence. And that's wisdom. So I think instead of looking at it as a question of what is wrong with me, what did I do wrong, which was always the go-to question I had for myself in those moments, we have to kind of look at the other side of the coin and go, "Mm, they're struggling. They have a hard time speaking up. That's not somebody I want in my life. I don't want to constantly be tiptoeing and trying to navigate someone who is going to avoid a conversation. I'm a huge communicator. So now it's clarity. I want more people in my life who are capable of communicating their feelings and speaking up for themselves. I deserve that because that's what I bring to the table as well. So really just, you know, maintaining that awareness of where they're at, feeling your emotions. If you need to get some sort of unspoken words out, then send the message or text it to yourself or write it out in a journal. And then find the clarity, find the wisdom in that experience and then start to move forward with that in mind. I I think that those are great points because I always tell my clients that there are lessons to be learned with every situation and every person that you meet. 
I know for me, I had to ask myself, what's the lesson that I'm learning here? And I needed to keep my boundaries the same with everybody in terms of not putting them on a pedestal, not idealizing them because of who they are. So I think those are are great, great points. And I also wanted to ask you, do you think that there's one type of person that gets ghosted more than the other? Or do you think that there's one type of person that attracts these types of ghosters? I mean, honestly, I think if you're a person who tolerates a lot of bullshit, (laughs) if you're a sensitive person who tends to empathize really quickly with others and have an immense amount of compassion for their excuses, perhaps, then you might get ghosted a little bit more, but I wouldn't say you're necessarily attracting these people, right? I I would say it's more, you know, we have to look at these as lessons learned. We have to look at these as opportunities for growth. Otherwise, we're really going to kind of torture ourselves trying to figure out what did I do to attract this person into my life. But if, if you pull out the wisdom after the fact, then really that's probably what brought it in is that you were tolerating a lot more than you wanted to. You were putting up with something that you probably wouldn't have put up with when your best friend does it to you, you know? And and I think that's what we struggle with sometimes. This is why it probably happens a lot more in romantic relationships is because we make romance different than friendship. We kind of just separate it and we think we got to act different or be different in that relationship than we are with our family or friends. If we can go in with the same mindset we carry with these people that are very close and near and dear to us, we're going to have success much quicker than if we're trying to tiptoe and navigate, oh no, like how do I attract love? The same way you attracted your best friend. You were just yourself. Absolutely. And I want to ask you one last question. What lessons have you learned from your experiences being posted? Well, I mean, that was the the number one lesson that I learned was stop putting up with a whole lot of bullshit. I, I am empathetic and I easily drop into compassion before I go to an angry place. So it's very easy for me to understand. And I, and I think just given the nature of the work we do, it's very easy to just understand what someone's struggling with and where they're coming from. And be like, it's okay. It's okay. If you can't talk to me, it's okay. And really sacrifice ourselves in that process. So what I took away from that was I matter just as much, if not more, because I've got to look out for me first. So my boundaries have to come before me tolerating an excuse. Absolutely. And Amy, tell me where people can find you because I want my followers to be able to follow you because I've been following you and I've gotten so much great information from that. So I know that you have an Instagram and a Facebook and you offer a free boundaries video. I would love for them to get their hands on that. Tell me where they can find you. Of course. So my Instagram is at Amy the Life Coach. Um, And there's a lot of free resources right on my page. I put a lot of time and energy into the captions and the posts. But if they go to the link in the bio right right on my Instagram, they can subscribe to my email list and immediately receive a free Boundaries 101 video download for them to keep and watch and study. Or you can go right to my website and get it, which is amyfiedler.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. I am so, so happy and so humbled that you came on the show. And please, everybody, go follow Amy. And then, of course, if you're not following me, you can follow me at Therapeutic Healing by Reese on Instagram, Facebook. And if you haven't rated or subscribed, it helps the podcast grow. So please rate, please subscribe, please tell your friends and share this podcast because I think so many people will resonate and get so much good information from Amy. Amy, thank you so much again. And until next time, see you guys on the next episode of Diary of an Empath. <laughs>